Thank you so much, Professor Bonilla, for amazing presentation. And now welcome our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Scott Forbes from University, uh, Brandon University in Canada. Welcome, we're happy to have you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks for sticking around for the fourth day of this uh, phenomenal creatine conference. I'm absolutely excited to be here to be talking and speaking alongside so many distinguished creatine researchers. Um, I'm a little bit younger than some of the previous speakers and uh, I've read a lot of the research growing up um, as an undergrad and as a master and PhD student, reading Dr. Kreider, Dr. Stout's work on creatine supplementation, Dr. Kando, Eric Rawson, so uh, to be speaking alongside those individuals is, is really exciting for me. But today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the impacts of creatine ingestion strategies on lean tissue mass and strength in older adults. And if you have any further questions following this presentation, I'm gonna go quite quickly. Um, you can obviously follow me on Instagram at Scott underscore Forbes underscore PhD. So, what are some of the consequences of aging? So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a cross-sectional image of the upper thigh muscles, and the light gray represents the muscle mass. You can see in an older individual who's sedentary, they have severe atrophy of that muscle tissue, and that can lead to reductions in muscle strength, as well as reductions in functionality and, and independence later in life. So we need to prevent this. The most potent strategy that we have based off the scientific literature is resistance training. Go to the gym, lift some weights, put them back down, repeat that several times, and we can help to preserve muscle mass in these older adults. And in combination or in conjunction with resistance training, creatine supplementation appears to be very effective. We know this already from previous speakers that creatine is synthesized endogenously within our liver and kidneys through three amino acids, arginine, glycine, and methionine. And once we create creatine, 95% of creatine is stored within the muscle. Two thirds of that is converted into phosphocreatine. And we can combine phosphocreatine with adenosine diphosphate to resynthesize ATP very, very rapidly. We also lose creatine as well, non, which is non enzymatically degraded into creatinine, about two grams per day. And we know that if we combine creatine with resistance training, we can get bigger and stronger muscles. And this is purported or mainly associated with that increase in phosphocreatine within the muscle. So we know that if you supplement with either a low dose of creatine, three grams per day for 20 day, 28 days, or you take a loading phase, typically 20 grams per day, for five to seven days, and then drop to a maintenance dose, you can get about a 20% increase in the amount of creatine within your muscles. But creatine works on the muscle through several other pathways as well. Creatine also increases the retention of glycogen. So now, not only do you have more fossil creatine, but you can also have more glycogen within the muscle, which increases exercise capacity allows you to train a little bit harder, and you can get bigger muscles over time. Creatine also acts as an antioxidant. And this is thought to be due to helping with the transport of ATP from sites of um, ATP production, the mitochondria, to sites of ATP utilization. We also know that creatine can increase IGF-1. So this was some of the great work done in the early 2000s um, by Dr. Darren Burke and Dr. Darren Kando, showing that those that supplement with creatine 
have increased levels of IGF-1. And IGF-1 is an anabolic hormone that can lead to a cascade of events, increasing mTOR, or the mammalian target of rapamycin, which can enhance muscle hypertrophy over time. We also know through some of the work of Dr. Tarnopolsky from McMaster University in Canada, showing that creatine stimulates water retention. And this water retention signals the muscle to grow and activates myogenic regulatory factors. These myogenic regulatory factors are going to activate satellite cells and satellite cells can mature into myonuclei. If you have more myonuclei within the muscle, that increases the capacity for the muscle to grow. And then there's also uh, animal evidence to suggest that creatine can inhibit myostatin. So creatine works through a variety of different mechanisms to enhance muscle hypertrophy and the effects on muscle health over time. And so most of the studies, and I, as I previously mentioned, you could take a low dose or a high dose of creatine with and without that loading phase, and you can get to a 20% increase. Well, those studies were done on younger individuals. And we know that older adults, they actually have a lower amount of intramuscular phosphocreatine, particularly in their vastus lateralis. So older adults may require a little bit more creatine than younger individuals to get some of the benefits, particularly on the lower body. And so what we did is we looked at all the studies that have combined creatine with resistance training in older adults, and there's been 20 such studies published. And we looked at their different loading or ingestion strategies. Some of them used a loading phase, some did not. Some of them used a uh, different, either a low dose maintenance dose, which was less than five grams or equal to five grams a day, typically three to five grams a day. And some actually used a maintenance dose higher than five grams a day. And so we wanted to look at these individual studies to see if it made a difference with regards to enhancing muscle mass and strength over time. And so we had, we, we had three major outcomes. One, we wanted to update the previous meta-analyses that have been completed. There was three previous meta-analyses looking at the effects of combining creatine and resistance training on muscle and strength in older adults. One was published in 2014 by Dr. Stu Phillips. Um, we also published one in 2014, myself and Dr. Karen, Darren Kando and uh, Phil Chilibeck. And then Phil Chilibeck and colleagues updated it in 2017. So we just wanted to, again, update that meta-analysis to ensure that creatine is still an effective supplement to augment gains and re resistance training gains in muscle mass and strength. But secondly, we want, wanted to further explore different dosing strategies. If a high dose or a low dose was just as effective to enhance these resistance training adaptations. And then third, a question that we always get, and there's a few studies on this, so we're able to start to look at this, was can you only take creatine on resistance training days, and is that effective? So our methodology, we included all the studies in the literature that were conducted on participants over the age of 50 that were randomized controlled trials, looking at either creatine with resistance training versus a placebo with resistance training. And they included some measure of lean tissue mass, muscle mass, and muscular strength. So first, let's look at lean tissue mass. And on the left-hand side here at the top left, you can see that blue arrow. This represents the low dose studies. So the studies that only used three to five grams of creatine per day. Here's the high dose studies that used more than five grams of creatine per day. And here's the total or the overall effect. So first let's look at the low dose studies. And what we look at is this black diamond, and if it falls to the right of this uh, line right here, that means that it favors creatine. 
So just taking three to five grams per day in combination with resistance training, these older adults got bigger muscles. So creatine was an effective supplement even at the low dose. The high dose was also effective as well. And when you combined the low dose studies and the high dose studies, again, it favored creatine supplementation. So creatine supplementation, regardless of dose, is an effective strategy, nutritional supplement to enhance muscle mass. We also excluded studies that used a loading phase as well to see if that played a role. And it was still effective to enhance gains in muscle mass. So our summary was that low and high dose strategies with and without a loading phase were equally effective at augmenting resistance training gains in muscle mass. And so this might not be a surprise to individuals in the, in the audience that are listening that are aware of some of those early research studies by Dr. Harris and Eric Haltman looking at either low dose creatine loading versus um, performing that loading phase. They got to the same about 20% increase within the muscle. But this is where things get a little bit interesting and that I get really excited about. So we also looked at leg press strength and recall that we mentioned that older adults have a lower amount of phosphocreatine within their vastus lateralis. So how much creatine do you need to get some of the benefits for leg press strength? And so again, here's the three different groups, the low dose, the high dose, and, and the overall effect. So overall, if you combined all the studies together, creatine combined with resistance training was an effective strategy to enhance low, uh, lower body strength or leg press strength. But if we look at the dosing strategies, it gets pretty interesting. The low dose strategies was not effective to enhance leg press strength. It was only the high dose strategies that were, effect were effective. And what we know as well is that if we exclude the creatine loading studies, that even that high dose became non-significant. So the p-value is above 0 0.05, which suggests that the combination of creatine loading and a higher dose of creatine, more than five grams per day, is required um, to achieve increases in leg press strength in older adults. So if you're an older adult and you just want big muscles, it doesn't appear to be required to consume a higher dose. But if you want the benefits with, with regards to increasing leg press strength or lower body strength, a higher dose may be required. So what about taking creatine on just the days that you train? And so there's been a few studies that have been published on this. And again, we've performed a meta-analysis. It looks like Dr. Darren Kando has published most of these studies. But what we found was that it favors creatine. So you can get bigger muscles, you can get stronger upper body and a stronger lower body just taking creatine on training days. So we know that that is an effective way to take creatine. So these are the three conclusions from our meta-analysis. Number one, creatine supplementation works. It increased measures of lean tissue mass and strength compared to placebo. Number two, both low and high dose strategies enhance muscle gains, but the combination of creatine loading and higher dose creatine is required to get those increases in leg press strength. And number three, Creatine supplementation only on resistance training days significantly increased measures of lean tissue mass and strength compared to placebo. So there's still a lot of gaps in the literature. We need to do dose response studies in other populations. We need individual studies, single studies that directly compare low and high doses. We need to look at just taking creatine on training days. We know that's an effective strategy, but is it as effective as taking creatine daily. We also need to look at cycling on and off creatine versus continuous intake. That's a question I commonly get. And then we need to look at the dose response studies on other tissues. 
things like brain health, bone health, maybe the mitochondria as well. So there's lots of studies that need to be done kind of further investigating some of these dose responses. So just to end the presentation, I'd like to thank my co-authors and collaborators on this paper. Dr. Darren Kando has been instrumental to me, um, but as well as Dr. Sergey Ostojik, Dr. Roberts, and Dr. Phil Chilebeck. You can find this article and more details associated with it. You can read the entire article if you want, which is an open access article published in the special edition in Nutrients. Thanks for your attention and thanks for listening. 